right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the weekend edition of Mr. Thompson's video lecture series. I'm coming to you live from my front room, and today we're going to talk about bones. Uh, we're going to go into um, general things about bones and bone tissue, then we're going to talk about different parts of the um, skeleton. So, without further ado, let's... Look at the bones! All right, so let's go ahead and start things off with a general discussion of bones and bone structure. So we're going to get into bone cells, bone tissues, and stuff like that. Um, getting us started, we're going to be talking about a couple of different types of uh, things going on. Uh, so this system is the skeletal system, right? And so the skeletal system includes all the bones of the skeleton, which you're going to learn about uh in the subsequent videos, but also the cartilage, ligaments, and other connective tissues. Um, and so this is what makes this a system. We've got different types of tissues. Now, for the most part, the skeletal system is all connective tissue. It's just different types of connective tissue. But we do have some other things going on, right? Uh, ligaments, we'll talk a little bit about in joints, is what holds bones together. There's other connective tissues and other perform other functions and stuff like that. The primary functions of the skeletal system include support, storage of minerals and lipids, which we'll talk about a lot in this video, blood cell production, which we'll talk a whole lot about in the spring, protection, and leverage. So we can classify bones based on their shape and their structure. And so when we're looking at their shape, there's a number of different shapes. We've got sutural is one, irregular, short, flat, long, and sesamoid. And so let's take a little bit of time and talk about those for just a second, talk about some of the characteristics. First, we've got sutural bones. Those are also known as wormian bones. These are small, flat, irregularly shaped bones, and they're typically found in between the different skulls of the bone. Uh, the number of these varies between individuals. Uh, so if you look at this picture right here, the uh, sutural bone is right there. It's found in between the different sutures, um, kind of like patches, basically. Then we've got irregular bones. Irregular bones are very complex shapes. They uh, include the vertebrae, the pelvic bones. If So if you look, and we're going to look at the pelvic bones in one of the other videos, so they don't really have a regular shape. They have a lot of different processes, which are projections and um, foramen, which are openings, and fossa, which are flat pieces. And I'll talk more about that um, as we go along because we're going to use those words a lot. We've also got short bones. Short bones are boxy-ish. Uh, these would be like your carpals in your wrist and the tarsals in your ankles. Uh, and so if you look at the diagram, they look relatively boxy. Now they're not perfect boxes, but they are short. Then we have sesamoid bones. And sesamoid bones are usually small and flat and round. They develop within tendons, typically located around the joints, like the knees, the hands, and the feet. They are, uh, there's a lot of different ones, um, and the location varies between individuals. Okay, so an example of the sesamoid bones, uh, pretty much everybody has two sesamoid bones. These are the patellae, your kneecaps, basically. So if you look, we've got short, round, relatively flat. Um, those are, um, uh, provide protection, kind of like a shield. Then we have long bones. Now, most of the time when you see pictures of bones and you think of bones, like think of skull and crossbones, those crossbones are your long bones, okay? They are long and slender. They're found in the arms, the legs, the soles, the fingers, and the toes. So examples would be uh, the humerus right here, the femur uh, would be two sort of classic examples. Then we have flat bones. Flat bones are thin with parallel surfaces, so they're flattened, typically irregularly shaped. Um, the examples of these would be the 
bones in the skull, in the sternum, in the scapula. Um, and we'll look at those a little bit in greater detail. Now, we can also talk about the general structure of bone. Now, we're going to be talking primarily about two of the types of bones, the long bones and the um, flat bones. So, looking at long bones, we've got three main areas, basically. We have the diaphysis, which is also known as the shaft, so this long part right here. The walls are made of compact bone with uh, a central marrow cavity, also called a medullary cavity. That's where all of our bone marrow is. Then we have the, ep the epiphysis, which is the widest part of the ends of each bone. So we're talking right here and right here. So like if you picture uh, a bone, or if you look for a picture, like a generic picture of a bone, uh, think of a dog bone, right? A lot of times you get one that looks kind of like this, right? And if you ask kids to draw bones. And so this middle part right here is the diaphysis. The epiphysis is this wide part right here. And then the spaces in between those are the metaphysis or metaphysis. That's just where the, two, the ends meet the shaft. Now the ends are typically filled, I skipped this part, are m filled with spongy bone, also known as trabecular bone. So they kind of act like shock absorbers, and I'll get into that in just a little bit. And then there's the metaphysis. All right, so here we have the structure of the flat bones. And so the flat bones, we're thinking like the bones in your skull, okay, your cranial cavity. They have spongy bone inside. So here's your... Uh, here's your spongy bone right in here. It kind of looks like a sponge, so the name makes sense. And then there's two, it's compacted between two layers of compact bone. So it's kind of similar to the shaft portion of the long bones, where you have the walls of the compact bone with the inside, uh, except in this case, the inside is um, spongy bone. And so within the skull, the skull, we have a special name for this spongy layer, and it's called the diploe. Dip low e. And that's just that layer of spongy bone, and it's uh, well that's within the, the cranial bones. You don't we don't call you know we don't use that in our diploe for other uh, compact uh, spongy bone places. Okay, so we've also got different kinds of types of bone markings. So the bone markings, uh, or also known as surface features, okay. Um, I'll jot that down. Uh, there's a number of them. So some of them include projections, which are places where different types of connect, different tissues connect to muscles, ligaments, tendons, and stuff like that. Um, and so you'll also find, you'll find these at joints where different bones articulate. So that basically means they come together. Uh, if two bones are articulated, that means they're joined together. So all your joints are points of articulation, okay? Um, and so where you have places where bones will articulate with other bones, you will find projections. We've got some examples of those. Um, for example, you've got projections. Uh, here's a femur. And so the head, it's a ball that's sticking out of the main part of the bone, and that's what, it, that's what sits into the socket of the hip. So that's one example. We've also got openings and depressions, the, also known as grooves. So like right here. And those are places where uh, blood vessels lie on the bones, as well as nerves. The thing of kind of like channels, where you're laying the vessels down, kind of like hoses. We've also got, um, well, those are the main ones we're going to talk about. There's other different types of projections. Uh, with it, like within projections, you got different ones. You got processes and ramus and stuff like that. Um, 
different openings. Well, uh, one word that's going to come up a lot when we look at things are uh, foramen, which is a, a rounded type of opening. And those are going to be, a, we're going to see those a lot in the skull when you watch the axial skeleton video. There's a number of different types of other bone markings, but these are the main ones that we're going to focus on. Okay, the projections and your openings. All right, so when we're talking about actual specific tissue, s bone tissue is a very dense, supportive, connective tissue, you know, lending itself to its one of its functions. There's a number of sp very specialized cells that we'll get into in just a little bit. Now, with, since this is connective tissue, we know that one of the defining characteristics of connective tissue is that it has a dense, it has an extracellular matrix. Now, stop and think about it for just a second and remember, what is the extracellular matrix? And so if you go back and you look at your notes, your extracellular matrix is the non-living material in which the cells are suspended in, okay? So when we talked about the skin, the extracellular matrix of the dermis is a network of protein fibers, okay? That reticular layer. So in bones, you have the same thing. Now in this particular case, the extracellular matrix is a solid matrix, mostly minerals, with some collagen fibers sort of creating that framework. So now we're kind of, if we're using analogies, your bones would be kind of like reinforced concrete that's had a uh, rebar laid in there. If you've ever seen construction workers pouring concrete for bridge supports, uh, road sections, sidewalks, there's a grid or some sort of network of rebar, which are just steel bars that provide flexibility and strength to the concrete. The actual concrete itself would be the uh, mineralized matrix. Now in humans, well, in pretty much all animals with skeletons, um, it's calcium compounds is what makes up that solid matrix. We have specialized cells called osteocytes. Those are bone cells within lacunae, and those are spaces, basically. It's a fancy name for spaces that are typically organized around blood vessels. Um, we have canaliculi, which are passages that allow for the movement of nutrients, wastes, and uh, gases coming in and out. And then we have a layer of tissue called a periosteum, which covers the outer surface of the bones, except for at the joints, because it would kind of get in the way. And that's those are usually those services are going to be covered in cartilage to act as um, to reduce friction and um, act as a shock absorber. The periosteum provides a path for blood vessels to go. It's highly vascularized um, tissue that's wrapped around the bones, and that's basically how the blood vessels get to the um, bones. And it's also important in bone growth when you're uh, when you're little bitty. All right, so we want to talk about the bone matrix for just a little bit. So the bone matrix is primarily calcium phosphate. Uh, and this matrix is going to make up two-thirds of the mass of your bone. And so that's one of the reasons why bone is so slow growing is because it's mostly extracellular matrix. Uh, now, a bone that doesn't have this matrix looks like a regular bone, but it's very, very flexible because we have, don't forget, we still have those collagen fibers. Um, which are those matrix proteins. So the, uh, about the other one third is um, uh, those collagen fibers. And so if you don't have that solid matrix, you have a bone that looks like a bone, but it's really, really flexible, almost like rubber. All right, so looking at the different bone cells, uh, they're only gonna make up about 2% of the bone mass. So most of your bones are gonna be the extracellular matrix. And there's four types of cells. We have osteogenic cells, we have osteoblasts, osteocysts, osteocytes, osteocysts are abnormal growths on the bone, we don't like those. Osteocytes, we do like, and then osteoclasts are the other types of cells. Uh, and their function is based off, or their the naming is based off of their function and stuff like that. So first, we have the osteogenic cells. Your osteogenic cells are special types of cells that divide to produce the osteoblast. So they're kind of like um, bone stem cells, I guess you could think of them like that. Um, 
they are located on the outside of the bone in the periosteum. They're also in the endosteum, which is on the inside lining of that medullary cavity. And they're primarily responsible for exist, um, creating osteoblasts, this one, and helping in fracture repair. And later on, there's a brief overview of how that particular process works. All right, cell number two are the osteoblasts. These are immature cells that uh, help produce the matrix during the process known as osteogenesis. That is also known as ossification. That's just bone formation. They will produce something called an osteoid. And so that's this blue stuff right in here. That is the uh, matrix, the uncalcified matrix. Uh, so it's just like the collagen fiber part. And then uh, as osteoblasts become surrounded by the matrix, the bone matrix, and basically get embedded in the bones, they turn into osteocytes. Now, osteocytes are mature bone cells. They don't divide. They don't have any space to. They're embedded in that solid matrix, right? So basically, it's like embedding something in the concrete. It's stuck there. They live in the lacunae between the layers of the matrix. Now, the lacunae, so this, it's this pink space right here. Okay. Um, they have extensions that pass through canaliculi, which are these little channels that lead off. So those are actually extensions of the cell. And they have two major functions. The first one is to uh, maintain the matrix. Um, so rebuild proteins and lay minerals, that calcium phosphate, um, and to, uh, repair damaged bone. So they're going to focus on repairing that matrix around those cells and stuff like that. Then we have the last one, the osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are multinucleates. So that's, that just means they have more than one nuclei. Now they come from the same class of cells that end up making um, uh, macrophages, which are very, very large cells. And then we'll get into how those are formed a little, um, a little bit later. They are primarily responsible for dissolving bone and releasing stored materials. Now, this process of uh, dissolving the bone matrix is called osteolysis. Osteolysis. Uh, remember, lysis is breaking something down. Osteo is bone, and so osteo uh, osteolysis is the breaking down of bone. And now we do that because... I don't remember if we say this later, so I'll go ahead and say it now. Um, we... Uh, release minerals that your body needs. And we're gonna, I, I know definitely we're going to talk about that later because um, your bones are the largest storage of a number of different minerals. And so these cells, these osteoclasts, will actually dissolve your bones and release those minerals. And so during bone growth and development and then maintain, maintenance when you're an adult, the bones, um, there's this constant back and forth between breaking the bones down to release the minerals and building the bones back up um, to maintain integrity. And there are certain disorders that are characterized by either too much buildup or not enough buildup um, that we'll talk about towards the end. Okay, so we have, so you take these different cells into different structures, right? And you put them together and you have something called an osteon. And the osteon is um, the functional unit of the compact bone. And so the osteon has a central canal, which is right here. And if you look on the inside, those are blood vessels. Okay. And so that's the main route that blood vessels get into, um, the bone. These would be like highways, right? And then we have perforating canals, which I have another diagram here. I'll, I'll scooch forward just a little bit. We have perforating canals that actually run perpendicular to the central canals that bring, that allow blood vessels to go laterally 
through the bone, providing nutrients to nearby cells and stuff like that. And then we have lamellae, which let me go back to this one. They are those. Uh, they look kind of like the tree rings. Okay. So the lamellae are concentric circles that are around the central canals that uh, fill the spaces in between the um, osteons, basically. So they're like the tree rings, essentially, of the bone cells. Okay, so that was... Uh, that's the compact bone structure. I don't think I said that earlier. Uh, the, all of that stuff with the osteons and things like that, that's all compact bone. So like the, if you're thinking of the shaft of the long bones, that's the outside part or the, the outer and inner layers of the flat bones in your skull. Inside of that, you have your spongy bone, right? Which is this stuff right here. And so it looks very, very differently. So spongy bone lacks these osteons. And it says, instead, it has something called trabiculi. Okay. Uh, and trabiculi are a, uh, a, an open network of matrix components. So um, collagen fibers and minerals. But they lack capillaries and things like that. Now, uh, you also find this inside the spongy bone, or inside the, the to a certain extent, the, the medullary cavity a little bit. Um, and so within these trabiculi, which sort of create, it's like a, it's a framework, basically, um, but it's a little bit of a less dense framework than what's found in the compact bone. In between the spaces of your uh, trabiculi, is red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is the the production site of red blood cells. Well, blood cells in general, because white blood cells are also manufactured here. Uh, there are a lot of blood vessels that run through this area, which sort of helps give it its red hue and allows those blood cells to get out into the bloodstream. You can also find yellow bone marrow in these spaces, and that is a... a Fat storage, basically. So you remember how we talked about the skin is one of the main places where fat is stored? It can also be stored in the compact bone of your, uh, the, in the compact bone of different parts of your body. Okay, so bone development is also known as ossification. So that's the actual building of the bone and the primary framework. Calcification is the de deposition of the calcium salts, with salts, which hardens your bones. And this is happening while the development is taking place. And so you're laying the groundwork and then you're filling the spaces in with those calcium sa salts to harden your bones. Now, there's two different types of ossification. We're going to be focusing on one of them today. So there's endochondral and intramembranous ossification. Uh, this is basically, so this ossification and calcification is bone growth. Now, most of your bone growth is going to happen during childhood with like growth spurts and stuff like that. Uh, but there are some bones that will continue growing upwards into the age of 25 or so. Okay, so endochondral ossification, that's the main one that we're going to talk about, is how most of your bones form. Now, what ends up happening uh, like a quick overview is there's a primary ossification center. So that's a primary site of development. It's going to develop inside hyaline cartilage, which is a type of cartilage that's um, like your bones kind of start out that way, basically. And then of oh, over time, as you're growing and your bones solidify, the cartilage is, and the cartilage tissue is replaced by bone tissue. Now there's seven main steps. And I've got a video clip that I'm going to show you here that's going to walk us through the major steps of um, ossification uh, in, quite frankly, a much better way than I could ever hope to explain it to you. So um, go through this video clip real quick. Um, jot down some notes as you're going through the seven main steps, and then we'll come back together. Welcome to another Anatomy and Physiology Smart Art video, where we guide you through an important piece of art. 
After watching this video, you should be able to describe endochondral ossification, the process that replaces the early cartilaginous skeleton with bone. The key concept to grasp is that a hard ossified bone in the adult actually begins in the embryo as a miniature version made of hyaline cartilage. Let's take a closer look at the humerus of this embryo about six weeks after fertilization to see how the miniature cartilaginous model is progressively replaced with ossified bone. This process is not fully completed in all bones until after puberty. Some do not fully ossify until the late 20s or early 30s. Here you can see the cartilaginous model beginning the process of endochondral ossification. The chondrocytes in the center of the model become active, increase in size, which reduces the matrix to a series of small struts, and then die, leaving open spaces. Blood vessels invade this area, and osteoblasts at the periphery lay down a superficial layer of bone. Fibroblasts, delivered by the blood vessels in the central region, differentiate into osteoblasts and begin to produce spongy bone at what is called the primary ossification center. Over time, the primary ossification center undergoes remodeling that forms a medullary cavity. This process repeats at multiple secondary ossification centers located at the epiphyses. The epiphyses retain a thin layer of articular cartilage within the joint cavity. This layer will remain in the adult and it covers the ends of your bones today. The epiphyseal plate separates the epiphyses from the diaphysis. This image here allows us to take a closer look at the epiphyseal cartilage to see how lengthwise growth of the bone occurs. Chondrocytes on the epiphyseal side of the plate continue to divide and enlarge, while those on the diaphyseal side die. Osteoblasts migrate to this region and lengthen the bone by laying down more bone. At puberty, various hormones cause the epiphyseal plate to be fully replaced with bone. This epiphyseal closure signals the end of skeletal growth. To summarize, endochondral ossification is a process in which we see the early hyaline cartilage skeleton replaced with hard ossified bone. It begins in the diaphysis at a primary ossification center and proceeds at multiple secondary ossification centers in the epiphyses. Hyaline cartilage remains at the epiphyseal plate to regulate lengthwise growth of the bone until skeletal maturity is reached and the plate ossifies. Articular cartilage remains in the joint cavity covering the ends of long bones. So what? Why is it important to understand how bone grows? Well, the presence of an epiphyseal plate rather than an epiphyseal line tells us that a person's skeleton is still growing. An x-ray of mature bone that has stopped growing can reveal a distinct epiphyseal line. However, an x-ray of immature bone shows what appears to be open spaces because the cartilaginous epiphyseal plate is not visible in x-rays. Also, fractures at the epiphyseal plate are serious and require careful treatment because the damaged bone may stop growing at this site risking asymmetrical limb length as the opposite limb continues to grow normally. Okay, welcome back. So, uh, as once bones have developed fully, through the rest of your life, we have bone remodeling, okay? Um, and this is the, mo uh, the a maintenance cycle characterized by recycling and renewing that extracellular matrix. The cells that are involved are the osteocytes, the osteoblasts, and the osteoclasts. Normally, the activities are balanced if renewal is faster, is removal if is faster than replacement. Bones will weaken, weaken. If deposition predominates, then bones get stronger. So if, uh, if they're broken, for example, or you get sick or something like that, then you have more deposition happening. As we get older, what ends up happening is more removal happens than deposition. So our bones get weaker. Um, so exercise, if you want to strengthen your bones and increase deposition, um, exercise does that. And then the recycling also helps uh, adapt to stress. The more you stress bones, the thicker and the stronger they become. And so exercise, especially weight bearings so or lifting weights and stuff like that, 
will actually make your bones stronger as well as making your muscles stronger. Now, one of the things when we get to muscles here in a couple of weeks, um, you need to have your bones strong as well as your muscles because it's your your muscles act against your bones to move your arms. So if your bones are very weak, what can end up happening is your own muscles can actually break your bones. Um, now, bone degeneration happens very, very quickly. Just a couple of weeks of inactivity um, can lead to a third of your bone mass being lost. Um, you know, and that which also makes starting over, you know, starting from the very beginning with exercise very, very difficult because your bones are also very, very weak. Uh, as far as nutrition is concerned, um, you have to have calcium, you have to have phosphorus in your diet. If you're lacking both of those, then bone development can't really take place. Uh, other things that are required, manganese, fluoride, iron, and magnesium are important uh, minerals, but calcium and phosphorus by far are the most. Uh, vitamin D, remember we talked about that, that skin, and your skin is the main place where we synthesize it. The process is a little bit more involved in that, but because it has to do with metabolism in your liver and some kidney activity and stuff like that. But basically, your vitamin D is really, really important in um, uh, calcium uptake. And so you have to have appropriate levels of vitamin D in order to absorb calcium and phosphate from your digestive tract so it can go into your blood and be used in your um, bones. And so that's why if you look at a lot of dairy products, for example, that have a lot of calcium, they're also fortified, which means that they add a supplement of vitamin D because you can take all the calcium you want, but if you don't have enough vitamin D, your body doesn't process that. Uh, vitamin C is also required for collagen synthesis for that fiber uh, component of the, the the protein fiber component of the matrix, uh, but it also differentiates uh, osteoblast. Vitamin A is important for osteoblast activity. Vitamin K and B12 are important for bone protein synthesis, so like those collagen fibers and stuff like that. Uh, what else? Growth hormone and thyroxine stimulate bone growth. Sex hormones are also important in bone growth and bone maintenance. Um, Testosterone and estrogen stimulate osteoblasts, so fluctuating levels of those can lead to releasing uh, those minerals from the bones and breaking down the bones. Um, let's see, parathyroid and calcitonin maintain calcium ion um, homeostasis. So, what a, so mineral storage. Um, the vast majority of your calcium is stored in your um, Bones. 39% of your bones are calcium. This makes up 99% of all the calcium in your body. Um, so if your body needs calcium, it's going to take it from the bones. That's why it's important to put calcium back into your body. and You have to have pretty high amounts of it. Uh, other minerals that are stored in there include uh, most of the body's phosphate, 99%, 80% of the carbonate, magnesium, 35% of the body's sodium is stored in your bones, um, and a little bit of your potassium, 4%. Um, calcium is the most, by far the most abundant mineral in your body. Um, they're also, not only are they important for teeth and bone development, but they're also really important for various physiological processes like muscle function. Um, and so calcium ion regulate are very closely regulated in your body. Um, and so that's why bone degeneration can happen very quickly because you need that calcium. It's very important. Um, and so that's also why it's important to, you know, manage calcium uptake and stuff like that. Okay, so bones can break, all right? Um, I'm sure a lot of y'all have known this firsthand, unfortunately. So there's a number of different types of fractures based on what happens to them. And so a fracture is simply a crack or a bone due to some sort of physical stress. Um, they can be open. Uh, which are also known as compound fractures. And so those are fractures that have are open to the air. The bone has pierced the skin. Those are the worst kinds. And there's a lot of reasons why. Or there's simple fractures, also known as closed fractures. So that's where the bone has broken, but it's stayed inside the skin, basically. There could be some tissue trauma around the bone, but it's still within the body. 
As in, there's the major types of fractures include transverse fractures that are cut uh, across the bone, displaced fractures where the fracture is broken and the bone is actually moved away, the compression fractures, so you'll find these a lot in the vertebrae in the neck and the back where squeezing pressures have actually broken the vertebrae. We've got spiral fractures. So that in this particular picture, it's kind of hard to see it, but it looks like a spiral, kind of like a drill bit or a screw. We've also got uh, epith epiphyseal fractures, which are fractures at the growth plate. And those are really, really bad. Well, you watch the video clip and it kind of talked about those because it has really significant implications on your ability to grow bones. You could have bones that are different, uh, different heights and different lengths. We've also got uh, communit uh, comminuted fractures uh, where it's kind of like the displaced fracture, but it's completely separated and you have um, fragments of bone embedded in the soft tissue around it. You've got green stick fractures where the fracture doesn't go all the way through. Uh, and the reason why I think they're called is if you've ever taken a branch off of a tree that's not dead, it's green, right? And so when you break it, one piece of the bark will pop up, but the rest of the bone, the rest of the stick is still intact. And so that's why we call these green stick. We've also got Cauley's fractures and Potts fractures. And these are typically going to be taking place in joints like wrists and ankles. Um, so fractures will heal themselves in four basic steps. Now we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail about these, just kind of be aware of the different steps. So first, after the fracture takes place, a fracture hematoma takes place. So that's kind of like a hematoma is like a, uh, kind of like a bruise baby, basically. So the space fills with blood to bring in clotting factors and white blood cells and stuff like that. Then we have a callus that forms and so kind of think of that like a bone scab i guess basically that's what helps me sort of get it through my head then we have spongy bone formation that happens really really fast so it starts to provide structure now the bone is still kind of weak at this point and then within the spongy bone formation kind of as a framework the compact bone forms um around it and replaces that spongy bone now in a lot of cases um, after you break the bone, you can have what's called an external callus. Um, and so that section of bone actually ends up being a little bit thicker than the rest of the bone, um, just to try to strengthen that particular section. Uh, a couple other things that real quick talking about as we get older, um, typically as we get older, bones become thinner, they become weaker. Um, this is known, uh, there's a there is a process known as osteopenia, which is inadequate ossification. So it's inadequate bone development um, and an overall reduction of bone mass. And this typically begins in your 30s and 40s. And so, oh, I mean, Mr. Thompson is right in that mark. So my bones are just going to start getting thinner. Uh, Y'all aren't there yet, right? Uh, women typically, uh, once this process starts happening, will lose up to 8% every 10 years. Men, you lose less. Well, men still lose it, but it's more like 3%. Um, let's see, the epiphyses, the vertebrae, and the jaws are most affected. Um, and so you that's why we get um, fragile limbs. Um, so you can have breaks more at the head of different bones and stuff like that. Reduced weight and uh, tooth loss. That's why as, as you get older and you're elderly, people's teeth start falling out and stuff like that. Um, they're more likely to break bones. Um, they become shorter. And a lot of that is because the bones are weakening and you also end up there's some compression going on in the back and weakening of some of those muscles, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and so another, uh, so an extreme version of this is osteoporosis. That's extreme bone loss. And so we've got, we, it's, it's got to the point where we're, where normal bone function is being compromised. Now, osteopenia is a naturally occurring process, but you're not overall impairing function. Osteoporosis is going to impair that function. Your bones just simply cannot work as well. Um, it happens mostly in 
women. So it, it, typically over the age of 45. Now that tends to correspond in, and why we focus, why a lot of times they focus on women with major hormonal changes leading towards the end of life. So in women, it's menopause In men, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. Um, but somebody remind me and we can look it up. Uh, it strikes 29% of women and 15%, 18% of men. So, um, you know, one in three women are going to suffer from osteoporosis. Um, and so uh, the reason why it happens during uh, menopause is because hormones are re regulate this process. And so these changes in hormones are going to lead to more building, breaking down of bones and less building up of bones. The last thing we want to talk about is cancer because cancer sucks. Um, so cancer and bone loss, uh, cancerous tissues will release osteoclast activating factors. And so your osteoclasts start working over time. And so we have overall bone uh, loss, um, which can lead to severe osteoporosis. Um, let's see. Well, I think that's going to be it for our overview of bone tissue. Um, please hang in there. Stay tuned. We've got a couple more discussions that we're going to do over the actual skeleton itself and start identifying some of those structures. We're going to start with the axial skeleton right here in the middle, right? That includes, that protects all of our important bits. And then we'll finish it with our discussion of the appendicular skeleton, our arms and legs and stuff like that. Um, so make sure you watch those. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, um, let's see. Otherwise, uh, I think that's it. Send me a remind message. Send me an email. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing y'all in class. Thank you.